Welcome to Aspen Ignites, Conversations to Build a Better World, a series from the Aspen Institute that brings together thoughtful people with diverse backgrounds and points of view. The Resnick Center for Herbert Byer Studies opened last year on the Aspen Institute campus in Colorado. In this episode, Institute President and CEO Dan Porterfield speaks with Benjamin Bennis and Andrew Travers about a new exhibition on Herbert Byer's Geographic Atlas. Ben, Andrew, it's great having you here on the Aspen campus for Aspen Ideas Festival and for the opening of an extraordinary exhibition that Ben uh, has played a pivotal role in. Um, and this exhibition on the world, Herbert Byers World Geographic Atlas is, of course, um, extraordinarily important to the Aspen Institute because Herbert Byer was the designer of this campus. Our aesthetic, our sense of design, and even how we work and how we facilitate conversation and learning really traces back to the genius of Herbert Byer. Um, well, you're a, a scholar of history of the art and design, um, and you made the call that this would be a great use of several years of your life <laughs> to study the World Geographic Atlas. Uh, so say a little bit about the Atlas and its importance. Yeah, the, the World Geographic Atlas uh, is this monumental, legendary work of graphic design that the Container Corporation of America commissioned. Uh, Walter Pepke, the founder and president of Container Corporation, as well as the founder of Aspen Institute, of course, uh, commissioned Bayer to design this uh, atlas in 1947. It was supposed to be finished in 1951 for the corporation's 25th anniversary. It was such an enormous and involved project that it took two additional years, it was finished in 1953, and was first presented to the public at the Aspen Institute in June of, of 1953, 70 years ago this, this week. Yeah. Um, it, it's had an enormous influence on data visualization and information design, and it's really served generations of designers as a, a model for making complex ideas uh, and specialized information uh, accessible and comprehensible to general audiences. It's really interesting that you found your way to this particular uh, project to research for many reasons, but in part because the Buyer Atlas was not actually sold. That's right. It was made and distributed, and yet it had a great deal of significance in the development of atlases and of data visualization um, and of design in general. And so how did it happen? What, what was it that made it influential? Yeah, well, in, in part, it was given uh, as a gift to all of the attendees of uh, uh, the um, International Design Conference in, in 1953, many of whom were themselves designers and took those ideas and ran with them and, and, and built them, but it also was circulated, uh, uh, given as gifts to geography departments, to uh, various research institutes yeah. and libraries and, and museums, and it was through uh, engaging with those collections that a lot of people uh, uh, discovered it and built on its example in, in subsequent years. So what made you want to study it? Well, I was already interested in uh, visual education generally. Uh, there, in addition to Bayer, several artists and designers of that same generation were interested in the way that new developments in modern art could be harnessed to make scientific information uh, uh, accessible to, to audiences. And initially I had planned a kind of survey book of you know, a, a lot of different uh, um, artists and designers who uh, had, had done that kind of work. And as I began researching Byers Atlas, it was clear that that particular project was just so involved, so exceptional, uh, that it deserved, deserved to be a, a yeah. book of its own. So chances are not many viewers are holding the Atlas right now in their hands, listening to us as we speak. Could you just mention three or four of the aspects of the Atlas that make it so significant? Yeah, it's um, this uh, uh, really innovative design that draws on several different uh, uh, graphic uh, uh, approaches. In particular, uh, this approach known as isotype uh, that we see in data journalism all the time today that involves um, countable uh, symbols uh, that were, are often used to, to, to show quantitative information. Uh, but the page design 
Uh, the typography was also really dynamic yeah. and engaging. And uh, for a, a, a book that is so encyclopedic uh, in scope, that's so dense in information, uh, the drama uh, of the graphics, the, the way in which uh, Bayer really kind of in, infused um, these, these pages with a really kind of dynamic organization uh, gives it a kind of momentum uh, that, that makes it feel like walking through an exhibition yeah. or watching a movie. Yeah. Um, and, and so I think that's what, what made the, 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 the Atlas really exceptional. Uh, at the How exciting. Of the um, so, Andrew, you're responsible for educational programming at the Resnick uh, Herbert Byer Center here at the Aspen Institute campus. And um, so you took on a almost equally monumental task of Byer himself and of Ben and writing about the uh, World Geographic Atlas to try to make it presentable to and engaging to a public that would walk through an exhibition that you made and maybe knowing nothing at all about this atlas then come away with some understanding of its importance. So uh, t tell me a little bit about what you did and how you organized the exhibition you made. Sure. Um, uh, I think there's a, there's a few points I would touch on. Um, one is just, you know, we want to find a way to help people see the atlas as useful or relevant to their lives today, yeah. right? Um, so I think Ben touched a lot on visual communication, visual education, right? So you think about today, things like, um, you know, young people using YouTube or TikTok for search rather than Google, right? Yeah. Certainly not going to an encyclopedia or an atlas looking for things, yeah. right? But um, one of Bayer's ideas, I think one of his groundbreaking ideas, and Ben's research you know, bears this out, is, you know, he had an incredible ideas about um, communicating visually, yeah. right? The term he used for a lot of the books of the day, the text of the day, was letter poisoned, right? Just yeah. that they were too dense, too, you couldn't understand it. So the idea was um, sort of clear, um, simple communication. Yeah. Um, a few things I, I would pick out from the exhibition that uh, I, I designed for the uh, educational purposes is the opening of that list touches on the history of the universe, <laughs> right? So. Up until Bayer's time, an atlas would have been a collection of maps, right? Yeah. Map of Colorado, yeah. map of the UNES, map of the world. His idea is he starts with, okay, here's what we know about the origins of the universe. He collaborates with the great astrophysicists of the day um, and then tries to present it to, uh, to, to readers. Um, the parallel we try to draw is to the James Webb Space, Space Telescope, yeah. right? Um, we all remember last summer in 2022, those images come out and the the new sort of mysteries of the universe and the you know the um excitement about learning yeah. more about that that comes out of that buyer's kind of doing a similar thing um i think similarly um the the other chapter that bookends the atlas is titled conservation of resources yeah really groundbreaking in that um he basically anticipates the concerns of the, the contemporary sustainability movement you know he's talking about um uh, you know, sustainable uh, movement of food, uh, you know, sustainable agriculture, um, mineral stores, those kinds of things, uh, healthy uh, forest cutting, that yeah. kind of thing. And he talks about the warming of the North Atlantic Ocean, you know, and it's published in 1953. Yeah. Um, uh, but he's not an expert in any of these fields, right? Um, and he's, he's collaborating with experts in, in all these various yeah. fields in order to present it to the public. So your exhibition includes something called the Inside Out Globe where the, the viewer can walk inside uh, a globe and look up and then see on the inside all of the countries and continents and land masses and waters of the world. Um, designed by Bayer for a World's Fair in the 1950s or so, what was he trying to accomplish with that visualization of the Earth? Yeah, fascinating. In, in the Bayer Center, in the exhibition that Ben co-curated, there's a uh, uh, some of Buyer's notes and sort of early, early pages. Yeah. One of them has the title on the top: "Maps Can Lie." Okay, yeah. he has this real intense interest in accurate representations of the Earth in two dimensions. What happens when you flatten it? How do we how do we present the world in a way that's that's uh, understandable that doesn't distort? Right. Yeah. Um, so he experiments in lots of ways with how to do this, how to present this, how to present different information with different maps in two dimensions, but even before he started working on the atlas, which he starts work on it in 1947. In 1943, he does an exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art titled Airways to Peace. Okay, and that's all about air travel uh, and the exhibition is subtitled A Geography for the Future. So the idea is sort of you know, the different ways that we're, we're understanding the world. 
he makes this outside-in globe, which is a 14-foot diameter walk-in globe where the countries and land masses and uh, all the globe is on the inside. Um, for, I think, a few reasons, and I'd love to hear, hear Ben talk about this as well. Um, I think, one, um, he wanted people to see the world as, as one. It's actually in the preface to, to, mm -hmm. the, to the atlas, um, he's, he asked people to consider the world as one. So he wants to be able to see it all, whereas on a globe, you know, yeah. uh, you, you can't do that on a map, it's going to be distorted. And also, I think, understanding the relationship between countries in terms of distance, mm -hmm. right? That we're not that far from, from Russia, as we might think, yeah. that, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Um, yeah, I think, Ben, Ben, I'm sure you can talk a bit about that as well. Yeah, I think that's, that's a, a really important uh, um, part, uh, the context, to understand the, the motivation yeah. for this outside-in globe. It's created in the midst of the Second World War. Um, the, as, as Andrew mentioned, uh, the subtitle of the exhibition, Geography for the Future, uh, Airways to Peace, it's about what the world is going to be like after the, the Second World War. And for a lot of the uh, experts that Bayer collaborated with on this exhibition, they took a position that the U.S. needed to be more involved in world affairs. Yeah. And so there was a kind of argument behind this that was an anti-isolationist huh. argument. Uh, this, you know, that you might look at a conventional yeah. map and imagine that North America is separated by these enormous bodies of, of, of water. But if we look at a polar projection, yeah. we can see we're not that far from the then Soviet Union. That's fascinating. Uh, and, and so it was um, basically asking people to reorient themselves. Yeah. Yep. So I want to ask about sort of the uh, construction of great things. Uh, your book, but before that first, it took Bayer five years to make the atlas and he did not make it alone. This mm -hmm. was, if, if anything, as I understand it, profoundly collaborative. Mm -hmm. So say a little bit about how this, how he made it happen, what it took. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think in, in part the most uh, uh, important lesson that, that comes from the, the Atlas is how valuable collaboration yeah. is across across disciplines. Um, Bayer, as, as Andrew mentioned, is not a, a scientist, and an, an expert, but he's, he's an expert in, in design. Yeah. And so he consults with astrophysicists and geologists and uh, uh, geographers, um, but also is looking at his colleagues who are doing really exciting work with data visualization uh, and is looking at uh, specialized journals that have valuable information but maybe don't have yeah. great uh, um, uh, methods to, to present that, that, that material. And so it's a combination of uh, building on the work that other people have done, synthesizing uh, existing uh, examples and, and, and pushing them further. And uh, he is joined by several graphic design assistants in his Aspen uh, studio, uh, and also has the uh, support and assistance of Joella Beyer, yeah. his, his wife, who is credited as a proofreader, but in fact had a much, I think, larger role in the, yeah. the Atlas, more of a kind of project manager corresponding with Rand McNally in Chicago and Container Corporation yeah. in Chicago and this uh, Italian cartographic firm uh, that, that collaborated on, on several of the, uh, the maps. Um, and so it was um, this real kind of cross-pollination. And, and, and one of the, uh, I think, arguments that, that Bayer makes is that uh, as a designer, it's really important to uh, really get a deep understanding of the material that you're being tasked to communicate, but that it's also important for experts to have some insight into the design process yeah. uh, and think about how their research might be translated to reach yeah. a, a broader audience. So I've had a chance to read through your book, which is gorgeously illustrated and beautifully expressed ideas that you, uh, uh, that you threw out. Um, I've been giving it to, as presents to a few people, uh, more to come. Hear it. And, um, how did you build this book? This couldn't have no. come fast. No, and, and I think you know I have a, a, a renewed appreciation for uh, uh, a buyer's um, conviction that yeah. this this collaboration is such an important um, uh, element. I had a wonderful uh, designer uh, that I collaborated with at RIT Press, uh, uh, Marnie Zoom, who who uh, really worked with me kind of back and forth to figure out the layout yeah. of, of of the book and. Um, uh, again, I gained all kinds of new insights into book design yeah. through the, the, the process. How and, much time passed, though, between when you decided you were going to pursue this and then holding the actual book in your hand? 
Uh, it took me about as long to do this as it took Bayer to create the <laughs> Atlas. And, uh, and, and just as it, it, by, you know, the Atlas was only ready at the, the last minute before uh, the design yeah. conference, uh, yeah. my book just arrived uh, about a week ago before the uh, Ideas Festival. And so there's a certain yep. parallel. Uh, 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 all, yeah, it, it's serendipity. <laughs> so, Andrew, there's an exhibition in the Bayer Center now of that it, it is about the Atlas and how the Atlas, in part, the ideas of it show up in the art of Bayer. Say a word about the exhibition and how it was created and um, what you're taking away from it. Sure. Um, well, two distinct exhibitions yeah. on the campus right now. Yeah. One is in the Bayer Center, uh, co-curated uh, by Ben and Bernard Jazar. Um, I think one thing I think that is really powerful about that show is it shows the the resonance of the atlas on Bayer's fine artwork, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of original artwork in there. It shows decades after Bayer makes the atlas, some of the figures that he he came up with or that he used in the atlas are showing up in his in you know, abstract art. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, amazing. Um, yeah. The uh, the show on the other side of campus uh, that I co that I curated um, ha includes the outside in globe um, and some interactive elements, um, including some that that I think demonstrate pretty well sort of that um, that that notion of distorted maps yeah. and that kind of thing. Help people understand that um, both exhibitions I should say include a digital atlas, so people yeah. can actually have the experience of, of moving through the atlas. Yeah. Over the course of the last fifteen years or so, Linda Resnick and Bernard Jazar are the individuals singularly who have helped the Aspen Institute understand the extraordinary aesthetic heritage that we happen to be sitting upon, this total work of art uh, that was designed by Herbert Beyer. Uh, and as, uh, as experts on the Bauhaus and on Beyer, uh, both of them have given us the gift essentially of our own past and our own, some frameworks we can utilize in our work today. Uh, Aspen's known for dialogue. Bayer constructed the campus to facilitate dialogue, both in the walkways and the pathways that he created to allow an opening of the mind, but also in the rooms he designed, which were circular and were about not a sage on, a sage on the stage, but a community in conversation. Um, so I wonder, Ben, as you've been on this campus now a number of times and uh, engaged with Bernard and with Linda and Andrew and others in the Institute, has that given you another appreciation for Herbert Beyer? Oh, yeah, with, with, without a doubt. Um, uh, I, I think the kinds of discussions, the sort of solutions that have come out of uh, uh, the, the discussions that, that we've had, working both with my co-curator, Bernard Jazar, uh, working with uh, uh, KVD, the design firm yeah. that that collaborated on on both the buyer center design as well as the uh, uh, education design. Um, I think none of us would have reached any of these solutions uh, independently. It was through this 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 kind of uh, uh, dialogue. Um, and you know, another thing that 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 strikes me is. Um, Bayer really wanted people to be able to take different paths through the atlas yeah. and to make their own kind of uh, 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 connections. And so there might be a graphic about one topic next to a graphic about another topic. And it was up to the reader to, to kind of correlate that information. And I think there's kind of something that uh, a similar that, that happens here with all of these sort of winding paths and kind of intersections. And, and I think that took place also in the course of translating a lot of the research uh, that, that you know, I'd done uh, uh, on, on the book into an, a, a, an exhibition um, and had the, the benefit of you know, Bernard's expertise on painting. And I was able to learn about aspects of uh, um, Bayer's career as a painter that I wasn't aware of. And, and, and then that, that um, brought out certain details in the Atlas yeah. that I wouldn't have otherwise seen. Now, so. well, it's, it's certainly true serendipity for the Aspen Institute that Linda and Bernard recognize the gold mine that we were sitting upon that we were that that herbert Bayer constructed um that with their leadership we were able to start to create a world-class resource to showcase Bayer's art and to have exhibitions like the one that you were helped to bring into existence that they understood the value of recruiting and andrew uh, or Alyssa ballinger to come work full-time at the asp institute to focus on the public education and the spreading of opportunity for dialogue and learning about the Bauhaus and about Bayer. And then here you are coming upon the Atlas and giving us this majestic work of scholarship, a gorgeous book, but also highly insightful right at the perfect time. 
uh, serendipity. I hope that uh, Herbert Beyer is looking down on us here from the campus he made <laughs> uh, and seeing that he's got the scholar that his atlas was waiting for. So thank you. Thank you, Andrew. My pleasure. Thank, thank you, Dan. Okay.